if you would, fill out one of those visitor cards on the pew in front of you so we'll have a record of your attendance. And our scripture reading this morning will be from 2 John, verses 9 through 11. 2 John 9 through 11. And for those of you who want to use a songbook, our first song will be number 572. Right now, let's stand and sing praises to God. Send the light. <clears throat> As the call comes ring on the restless way. Let us all pray together. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that we're able to gather here in this place this morning. We pray that we've gathered here for no other reason than to give you the honor and the glory that you deserve. Father, we thank you for this privilege it is for us to, to meet here each Lord's Day. And we pray that we might always have this privilege in our lives. Father, we pray that you'll watch over us as we're here, that you'll keep us safe, you'll, you'll guide us in our studies this morning. We pray for so many things that we know that if we're faithful in our prayers, that you'll answer those things that, that we petition before you. And we just pray that you will watch over us and always guide us so that we might be found <clears throat> right and faithful before thee. Father, we are thankful that each of us here this morning are physically well enough to be here, and we pray for that continued health so that we might always enjoy this assembly where we can come together and fellowship with one another. But Father, we are mindful of those of our number who are not blessed with good health this time and, and other factors in their lives that keep them away from us. We pray that if it would be thy will, you would restore them back to good health or whatever their needs are in their lives so that they could be here and worship with us in person as well. And Father, we do know that there are families who 
are mourning still at this time because of the loss of a loved one. We pray your blessings would be upon them and they would be uplifted by, by looking to thee and that we as their brothers and sisters in Christ could be the encouragement that we should be as well. Father, we thank you for our congregation that meets here at this place. Um, may Bobby Branch always be the light up on a hill in this area. We, we're blessed to have so many members here who are faithful and true to thy word. We just pray that you would always bless all the efforts here and in this area that we could help spread and grow thy kingdom and, and even take thy kingdom to further reaches outside of this area. Father, we thank you for the ones who preach and teach thy word, especially here for us from week to week. We pray for Brother Tony and Brother Jason as, as they do preach and teach to us. We thank you for their ability and their efforts and the way that they can present your word to us so that we can easily understand it. And we just pray that you would continue to use them in spreading thy word. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for each one here who takes part in whatever way to help our congregation grow and to be strong and to do thy will. We just pray that you would continue to bless all the efforts made here and much success would come out of the work done in this congregation. Father, we thank you for so many blessings of this life, this day. We live in a great country and you bless us beyond what we deserve. And we just pray that you would continue to bless us as you do and that we would not take those blessings for granted, but that we would give you the, the praise for everything that you bestow upon us. You have given us homes, families, good jobs, or, or health, many material things that, that bring us comfort and joy. You give us the necessities of this life, and we know those are all gifts from thee. But above all, Father, we thank you for the blessings that are of a spiritual nature this morning. We, we thank you for the Bible, for your word, and the guidance that it is, the instruction that it is for our lives. And we just pray that we would put your word into our hearts and we would use the Bible to, to guide our lives. And we thank you for the church that we can be a part of and we can be a part of this congregation here that meets at Bobby Branch and have fellowship with like-minded brothers and sisters in Christ. And we thank you for this avenue of prayer, Father, that we can lay our thoughts and cares before you um, whenever we can. Most of all, Father, we thank you for Jesus this morning. We thank you for knowing that he lived that perfect life here upon this earth. And, and he was willing to give up that perfect life so that he could be that sacrifice that was needed so our sins could be washed away and we could one day enjoy a home in heaven with thee. We thank you for that great and perfect sacrifice that was made on our behalf. <clears throat> Father, as we go through this service, we pray that you'll help us to have open hearts and receptive minds to thy word. We pray that we would block all the thoughts of this wor world out of our minds just for this short time so that we can truly focus upon the things that you would have us to study and learn this morning and we could take those lessons and put them into our hearts and lives and as we go out into the world later in this week, that we can be the example that you would want us to be at Christians and we could help show others what it is to be a faithful and true Christian. Father, we just pray now that you'll go with us throughout the remainder of this service. We ask that you'll guide us, help us to do everything pleasing to thee. And if we fall short in any way, we ask for your forgiveness. We just pray that you'll go with us now, go with us always. And when we come to the end of life upon this earth, may we have that home in heaven with thee. All this we pray in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> On Jordan's stormy banks, sing the first, second, and last verse. <clears throat> <clears throat>
case you might have missed it, our elders have provided a place in our foyer where you can place your collection today. And it is just uh, outside the doors at the rear of the auditorium. We know as Christians that the first century church was admonished and commanded to collect funds so that the gospel might be spread and those that were doing that service could be supported. And so we too have the same commandment that we are to provide for the treasury of the church so that our elders can administer those funds in a way that is appropriate to support our local work, our benevolent work, and spreading the gospel. The difference between the Old Testament contributions and what we do today is, as we recall in the, <clears throat> in the Old Covenant, they were told to set by 10% of everything that they had to tithe. But we as Christians have been given the latitude and the opportunity to examine the great things that God has done for us and to look at the prosperity that we have and to decide what is appropriate and to then lay that back, and lay it by in store in such a way that we should do it with a cheerful heart. Shall we pray for the contribution? Our Father in heaven, we are thankful for life and the blessings that you give to us each day through your providence and your care. For the talents that you've given us that we can sustain life, that we can prosper, and now that we have the opportunity to support the work of this church and this congregation, we're thankful, Father. And we thank you that the prosperity of this great land in which we live is such that we have things beyond our imagination. And we thank you for that love for us and providing for us. This day, may we look into our hearts. May we examine those great blessings. May we look at the needs of this congregation of your people. And Father, may we con contribute in a way that would be acceptable in thy sight. For this prayer we ask in Christ's most holy name. And amen. An invitation hymn this morning will be I Am Resolved 255, but to prepare our minds to partake of the Lord's Supper, we'll sing Low in the Grave. <clears throat>
did not receive a communion cup when you came in, please raise your hand and our ushers will be glad to provide that for you. <clears throat> As Christians, we understand that the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ was one of the greatest things that has happened in history, but more importantly, it is one of the greatest things that has happened to provide for us that hope of eternal life. And we understand that his body was shred by the tongs that were administered to his body. We understand that he was mutilated in ways that I don't think sometimes <clears throat> we can comprehend. But we know that he understood that he understood what he was doing and that he withstood the pain and the agony that was administered uh, to him by the sufferings that he underwent. And we're thankful that God, through his infinite wisdom, understood that we as humans would be sinners and we would need an opportunity to have a offering for our salvation. And we want to offer thanks this, at this time for the bread that symbolizes that body that was hung upon the cross. Will we pray together? We thank you again, Father, for hearing the prayers that we offer this day. We're thankful that you loved us and you provided for us a pathway to heaven. That you gave us the opportunity through the commandments and the supper that Christ established. That through this memorial we can be reminded weekly of the great sacrifice that was made for us. Father, as we partake of this bread, we pray, Father, that we would reflect on those things that you have given to us. We would reflect upon the great sacrifice that Christ made for us and help us to do so in a way that would be pleasing unto thee. For this prayer we ask in Christ's most holy name. And amen. As we study the scriptures, we read time and time again of the continual cleansing of our sins that takes place because we have been baptized and that is emblematic of the blood of Christ that continues to wash us, to cleanse us of our sins and those things that we do wrong. We pray that we would think about those things that we would look and be thankful each day for that care and that love and that sacrifice that was made for us. Shall we pray for the cup? <clears throat> Father, we are thankful for your love for us. We're thankful that you forgive us of our sins when we are repentant. And this day we pray that you would look into our hearts, that you would know that we are sorry for the things that we might have done that were against your word and your will. But Father, at this time, we are thankful for this cup that is emblematic of that blood, the blood that cleanses us and makes us white as snow. We pray, Father, that we would always be thankful and mindful of that. Be with us as we partake this day, and always forgive us of our sins. For this prayer, we ask in Christ's most holy name, and amen.
As announced, the reading will come from the book of 2 John, verses 9 through 11. <clears throat> Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house nor greet him. For he who greets him shares his, his evil deeds. I'm extremely thankful to be back this morning in the pulpit here. I enjoyed a great week last week with the good brethren in the Greenville Church of Christ. They have excellent elders, a great gospel preacher. It's a privilege to be there with them. But I can tell you there's no place like home. I'm just so glad to be back with you. And I'm glad for us to have the opportunity to study the letters that John wrote when we studied 1 John, we realized that John saw that his children in the faith needed some encouragement and some confidence. They were facing all kinds of challenges, and he wanted them to know that he was personally aware that Jesus came in the flesh. He said, we saw him, we touched him, we heard him. He then wanted us to know that God was who he is. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. God is love, John tells us in that first letter. John also wants us to understand that we are God's children, and there are blessings in it. And he wrote that we might know that we have eternal life. John also wrote that we would know that we had the petitions we ask of him, if we ask according to his will, so much in 1 John about confidence in who God is and what God has provided for us. The second letter that we are studying now was a short letter. In fact, it would fit on a half a sheet of paper. We would probably call it much more like a postcard rather than a letter. And in this short letter, John was this time concerned about people who might lose their reward. In fact, two weeks ago, we studied verses 7 and 8, where John talked about that we lose not the things that we have worked for. Many people put a lot of effort in trying to become a Christian and trying to live the Christian life, and he didn't want them to give up or to give in. The verses that follow, verses 9 through 11, John is focused this time on the problems that can be brought in to a local congregation and the kind of problems that might arise from that. This morning, we're going to study verses 9 through 11 of 2 John, and there are three things that we want to observe the first one will be the faith and going too far. Second will be the fatality of going too far. And finally will be the fellowship of those going too far. If you will, let's take our Bibles and let's see if we can follow along through this. The King James and the New King James use the word transgresses. If you're reading the American Standard, which I used for many years, was Whosoever goes onward. If you're reading the New American Standard, it says, whoever goes too far. You see, you could understand what is meant by this by looking at the words that follow. He said, abides not in the doctrine or abides not in the teaching versus someone who abides in the teaching. I think it's interesting that the word that is translated transgresses or goes too far is from a word which we get our English word progressive from. I know you've heard about people who are progressive. They are people who want to keep going and going and further. Well, that might be good if that's your business. That might even be good if you're a city to be progressive. But when it comes to God's word, it's wrong to be progressive. 
because one who is progressive goes too far, they'll go beyond. In fact, you must stay within the doctrine of Christ. And if I go beyond that, it's almost like a person who has to stay within a line. You know, it's interesting in sports. There are boundary lines. If you're playing basketball, there are borders or boundaries there that if you go out of it, you're out. You can't proceed any further. Or if you're playing football, the same thing is true. There are lines on the sides. If you're playing tennis, it's the same thing. There are boundary or border lines. And those lines are not supposed to be crossed. We have to understand the same thing is true when we talk about the doctrine of Christ. It is contained in his teaching. And if I decide I want to go beyond that, I want to go beyond what God has said, I'm transgressing or going too far. Somebody says, well, what is the doctrine of Christ? Whosoever goes onward, whosoever goes too far, whoever transgresses, and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ, well, somewhere along the line, I've got to understand what that means. Well, in the original language, you can pretty well decide because it's called a genitive, and some would say it's the doctrine about Christ. That's called an objective genitive because he's the object of it. And when you read those kinds of things, you People would say, well, it's talking all about who Jesus was, was that he was the son of God, that he came in the flesh, and certainly that is part of it. But there's another way of looking at it, and that is the doctrine from Christ. And that's called subjective genitive in the original uh, language, if you're looking at language formats. In fact, there's actually one that's even called the plenary genitive, which means both about and from. Now, for just a minute, I think it's invaluable for us to look at some parallel passages and see if we can see some application here. Matthew 16 and verse 12. They understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees. I'm going to say doctrine of, and okay, now does that mean the doctrine of about the Pharisees and Sadducees? Well, no, no, that's what they were teaching. Or I can go to Revelation chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. But I have a few things against you because you have those who hold the doctrine of Balaam. Now, someone says, well, is that a doctrine about Balaam or is that the doctrine that Balaam taught from him? Well, look at what it goes on to say. Who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit fornication. It goes on in verse 15, and thus also you have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. That's not the doctrine about them, it's the doctrine that they taught. Or John 7 and verse 16, the way Jesus phrases it there, he said, my doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. When Jesus comes, he is teaching what the Father has taught him. So it's, it's not the doctrine about him. It's the doctrine which he taught. Or 1 Timothy 6 verse 3, If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to the wholesome words, even to the words of Christ and the doctrine which accords with godliness. The doctrine, the teaching is that which comes from Christ. That is also synonymous with the faith as we read in other passages in the Bible. One of the most important passages in that little short letter that Jude wrote was found in verse 3 when he said, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith. The faith that, jo that Jude was saying you need to contend for is the same doctrine of Christ that John writes about here in 2 John verse 9. In Romans 10 and verse 8, but what does it say? The word that is near you is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. It's a message that is preached. It's a doctrine that is preached. 
In Galatians 1.23, they were saying about Paul, he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy. And one more, 1 Timothy 4, verse 6. If you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and the good doctrine which you have carefully followed. Now, I think most of you have got the point by now that when John is writing here, talking about the doctrine of Christ, that we've got to abide within it, it's talking about the teaching which Jesus himself gave. Now he says, whosoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. Folks, that's a fatal thing to not have God. If I read passages like Ephesians 2 and verse 12, Paul was describing the Gentiles before they became Christians. But notice the way he describes them. He said, at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. And notice the way he finishes this up. Having no hope, and without God in this world, if you don't have God, you don't have anything. If you don't have God, you can't go to heaven. He said, whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. And so, you see where that leaves you. We have to abide in Christ to survive spiritually speaking. In John 8... Jesus was writing or speaking to some Jews and there were some of them that believed, some of them that didn't. And he said, then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my word, then you are my disciples indeed and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. You stay within the doctrine that I have taught you these words. And he said, you're my disciples. and That'll make you where you know the truth. Now make you where you know what's right. But when you get to John 15, he uses an illustration which is extremely valuable, extremely helpful. He said, abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. You understand what Jesus is saying here? Either you're going to abide in him, you're going to stay in him, you're going to listen to him, or you're not. And he said, if you don't, he said, if anyone does not abide in me, he's cast out as a branch and is withered. They gather them and throw them into the fire and they're burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask whatever you desire and it shall be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, and so you will be my disciples. He said the same thing here in John 15 that he said in John 8. You abide in me, you're my disciples. You don't abide in me, and then you're just to be cast out. There's a fatality of failing to abide in the doctrine of Christ. I love to use Old Testament illustrations. Of course, you know that already. In the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah is going to explain to them why God has rejected them as a people. And the way he uses it, he says, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. On the one hand, God has provided living water. Here it is. And he said, Here's the two evils that my people committed. First of all, they've forsaken the fountain of living waters. What did they do? They went over here and they created their own cisterns. When you start thinking about the doctrine of Christ, here's what God has provided. And some people say, well, that's not enough. That's not what we want. So we're going to go over here and we're going to create our own doctrine. You keep reading in verse 17. Have you not brought this on yourself in that you've forsaken the Lord your God who led when he led you in the way? And now why take the road to Egypt? 
to drink the waters of Sihor? Or why take the road to Assyria to drink the waters of the river? Your own wickedness will correct you. Your own backslidings will rebuke you. He said, no, it's an evil and a bitter thing that you've forsaken the Lord your God. To not abide in the doctrine of Christ has catastrophic consequences. Now, I think what John was trying to do was to say, here is the doctrine. You abide in it. You don't transgress it. You don't go beyond it. You don't go too far. But you get to verses 10 and 11, and here's the application of the point he's trying to make. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house, nor greet him, for he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. John knows the challenge that's going to be placed before Christians. He knows that Christians are going to be presented with all kinds of teachings, all kinds of doctrines, and how will they respond to it? You see, the faithful child of God knows better than to allow error to be welcomed into his house. Now, if this dear sister here, that is um, the one to whom John wrote this letter, is a Christian, most likely she has a congregation meeting in her house. And what do you do when someone comes and they want to speak in your house? Well, one of the things you may need to know is what are they going to say? What are they going to teach? And if what they're going to teach is not within the doctrine of Christ, you say, oh, you're not going to come in here and teach that. We're not going to permit it. In fact, we're going to reject you from doing that. When I go to other passages of Scripture, I can see that taught very plainly and very well. For instance, in Romans 16, verses 17 and 18, Now I urge you, brethren... Note those who cause divisions and offenses. Listen very carefully to what he says. Contrary to the doctrine which you have learned. And avoid them. For those or such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by their smooth words and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the simple. What John is trying to say is exactly the same thing that Paul said. And that is there are people out there who are going to come and they're going to bring other doctrines. When they do, they're divisive. They're creating conflict within the congregation. He said, avoid those people. He said, those people are trying to deceive the hearts of the simple. Now, if you walk into a congregation like here at Bobby Branch, there's some of you who've been Christians for many years. You can tell the Truth from the error, just like that. You know the difference from right and wrong. But you know, there's some of our young people may not. That's not because they're not good young people. It's because they haven't had an opportunity to be taught enough yet or well enough yet. You don't allow a false teacher to come in and teach error is what Paul is trying to say. I can go to Galatians and listen to what he says there. He said, but even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what you have received or what we have preached, let him be accursed. As I said before, so I now say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. It's literally anathema, accursed of God. You want to know how Paul feels about it? Now listen to Titus chapter 1, verse 11. He's talking about the role of elders and the shepherds of that local congregation. And he says, uh, when someone comes in and they're teaching these divisive things, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. He said, if you know somebody's coming in, they're teaching something that's false. He said, you stop them, you shut their mouths, you don't let them speak. Chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. Reject a divisive man after a first and second admonition, knowing that such a one person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. There are people who are going to do that, and he says, what you need to do is you need to reject them. You don't accept them. 
Now, helping those who oppose God puts us in opposition to God as well. He says, if you bid them Godspeed, you welcome into your house, you give them greeting, he said, you become a partaker of their evil deeds. What you've done, you have given them a place and a voice that God never intended for them to have. Again, another Old Testament illustration, which I think is extremely helpful. As you go back and you think about Jehu, who is rebuking King Jehoshaphat because of his alliance with Ahab, here's what he says. And Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? Therefore, the wrath of the Lord is upon you. But I thought Jehoshaphat was a good man. He'd done so many things good. In fact, he had asked, is there not a prophet of the Lord whom we may consult? Oh, yes, there is Micaiah, but I hate him because he doesn't ever prophesy good concerning me, but evil. But God said to Jehoshaphat, when you help the wicked, you are now under my wrath as well. 1 Kings 21, 25, but there was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do wickedness in the sight of the Lord because of Jezebel, his wife stirred him up. You can't find a more wicked man in the Old Testament than Ahab. And here's Jehoshaphat helping him. When you and I decide that we're going to give voice, give an opportunity for someone who doesn't abide in the doctrine of Christ a voice, then we're helping them. And God's wrath abides on us as well. Well, how, what are we supposed to do then? In Ephesians 5 and verse 11, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Older translation said reprove them. The idea means that we show what they're saying is wrong and we expose it as being error. We don't accept it and we say, here's where it's wrong. Here's where you need to avoid it. We educate the congregation. <clears throat> James 4 verse 4. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. We really have to decide whose side we're on. Are we on the side of God and the doctrine that Jesus has brought to us that we're supposed to live within and follow and be a part of? Or are we going to listen to our friends? You know, sometimes we're more worried about offending our friends than we are offending God. <clears throat> And from John's perspective here, it's important that the church not offend God. David, Psalm 139, verses 21 and 22. Do I not hate them, O Lord, who hate you? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with a perfect hatred. <clears throat> I count them my enemies. We have to be very careful that we stay within the prescribed teachings of the Lord. We don't go too far. Some people ask the question, why do you folks in the churches of Christ, why don't you do this? For instance, why don't you have priests who get up and wear priestly garbs? Well, it's because the New Testament doesn't teach that. Why don't you have instruments, music in your worship? Because the New Testament doesn't teach that. What we are trying to do is stay within what Jesus taught us to do, no more and no less. In 1 Corinthians 4, verse 6, Now these things, brethren, Apollos and I have transferred to myself, or I figured he transferred to Apollos and myself for your sakes, that you might learn in us not to think, and the American standard says to go beyond the things that are written. They wanted us to learn, not to, to want to go further, not to be progressive, but to abide within them. 
Deuteronomy 4, verse 2, a warning to the Old Testament. Do not add to the word which I command you, nor take from it that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God. You do what he says to do. New Testament, Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19. He said, anyone who adds to the things that was written here, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. Anyone takes away from the words of this book, God will take away his name from the book of life and his part from the book of life and from the holy city and the things that are written in this book. You see, you have to be within. You don't fall short, nor do you go too far. And so where we end with our lesson this morning is, are you in a safe place? Are you within the doctrine of Christ? Now, if you've not yet become a Christian, you're not in that doctrine because you've not carefully followed it. The doctrine of Christ requires you to believe that Jesus Christ is God's son. John has taught that over and over again. He taught it particularly in John 20, verses 30 and 31, that the things that were written, that we would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing might have life in his name. John also taught us how important it was that repentance take place, confession of our faith in Christ and being baptized for the remission of our sins. When a person does that, according to Acts 2, 47, God adds us to the church. Because we're the ones who are being saved. But now, once we become Christians, it's very easy for us to decide, you know, I think I want to go a little bit further. Uh, sort of like coloring outside the lines. And when we do, we violated God's law. And at that point, if we do not correct it, we stand condemned. And you know what we have to do? We have to come back and say to God, God, I'm sorry, I know I've violated your law I've gone too far I've transgressed and I want to be restored this morning we're going to sing the invitation song I am resolved which means I've made up my mind well are you resolved this morning to become a child of God are you resolved as a Christian who's wandered away to come back home if you need to come, please come as we stand and as we sing. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my
sing Psalm 971. Thank you so much for your attendance today. Uh, we hope our services was uplifting and, and, and a blessing, I say, to you. And, but most of all, we hope it was, was, is and was a glory to God. And uh, those that have joined us on Facebook, we certainly hope somehow soon you can come back and be with us here. Uh, visitors, thank you very much for being here. We have some from out of town, and we certainly hope as you, you're traveling back to the home, your home today or whatever, you'll certainly have a, a safe trip back, but, but come back and see us whenever you, we can. We do have classes for all ages, and if you need help finding those classes, let some of us know, and we'll, we'll be glad to help with that. Once again, remember those that were that are sick, or that was mentioned that are sick and shut in and bereaved, and remember them and send cards or calls or whatever is necessary uh, or to, to encourage them. So our next service is tonight at 6 p.m. And at that time, our young people will be conducting the services. Uh, please come back and encourage those young men. It, make, it goes a long way, believe me. Been there, done that. Please come back and encourage these young men as, you, as they go forward. We'll sing the song and be dismissed. May God bless each one. Restore my spirit, Lord, I need restore. My heart is weary, please help me, dear Lord. I stand in need of more strength from your word. Renew my love, rebuild my faithful, restore my soul. Revive the fire. us all to realize that there is no better way to restore our souls through the study of your word. Father, we thank you for the service that we've just enjoyed. Father, we thank you for the Bible classes that are to follow. Father, please help us to recognize the study of your word and how important that is. And in addition to that, how valuable it is that we can meet here together in Bible classes and study your word together and to learn the lessons that are going to be presented by those who have put time and effort into our classes. Father, please help us to understand that we need to take advantage of this. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.